نتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا من سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على العرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما وقال النبي الكريم صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم أيها الناس أفش الصلام أفش السلام وأطعم الطعام وصلوا الرحام وصلوا بالليس والناس صلوا بالليل والناس نيام تدخل الجنة بسلام أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام أما بعد all praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to see another day of Jumu'ah and fulfill the rights that are due unto Him. And all praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to be able to call ourselves Muslims, <coughs> to be able to say that we are those who will be saved on the day of judgment. And all praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us His last and final messenger, Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, to be our guide and example. Well, this is going to be a full Jum'ah today. I know everyone wants to be comfortable, but we're just going to have to get tight. If everyone can please scoot up and get as close as we can. There's going to be a lot of people here today, inshallah. You know, this holiday season is an excellent time for many of us because it allows us the opportunity to spend time with our families. Whether or not we celebrate the holidays isn't of importance. What's of importance is, is that we get to have time off. We get to have schools that aren't running because the kids, can be at, the kids can be at home as a result of that. We have parents being able to take off work without any difficulty. All these things are wonderful and they're good opportunities for us. So with a big crowd here today, what I wanted to talk about is something very, very simple within our deen. In the hadith that I mentioned, which is known by many scholars as the hadith of Salam, it's narrated by Abdullah ibn Salam, the companion of the Prophet وسلم, who used to be a Jewish rabbi. And when he accepted Islam, it was right when the Prophet وسلم, arrived. The narration is a fascinating one, because not only does he narrate the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, the first khutbah, really, or the first uh, sermon, or if you want to call it a khatir of the Prophet gave, he narrates that. But even before that, he narrates the story of how he became Muslim. And he went to the Prophet ﷺ, and he said to him, I have three questions for you. I want to ask you three questions. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, tell me what they are. And when he told him, the Prophet ﷺ answered them sufficiently for him. He answered them sufficiently. And at that moment he said, Ashhadu annaka Rasulullah wa ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah. So he narrates this that I accepted Islam and the Prophet answered these questions for me. And at that moment in time, I went to him and I said, Ya Rasulullah, then my people, inna yahud qawman buhud. My people are such that they will embarrass me, they will speak ill of me if I find out that I became Muslim. And so him and the Prophet can concoct a little plan. And they go into the gathering of the, the Jewish rabbis, whom Abdullah ibn Salam عنه, is, is close to. And he asks them that, what do you think about Abdullah ibn Salam? What are your thoughts about him? He is the, uh, one of the most knowledgeable from amongst us. And his father is one of the most knowledgeable people. His lineage is wonderful. He's one of the best people. And he has great lineage. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, and what do you think about Islam? Were he to accept Islam? And they say, Allah may Allah protect him from it. The Prophet ﷺ at that moment he motions, and at this point Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu steps out from behind a curtain. And he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And at that moment in time, these rabbis, those who spoke ill of him, they say that this man is the worst of us. He speaks the worst. He's one of the least knowledgeable people. He has the worst lineage. And so Abdullah ibn Salam has proven true. But in the very first hadith that I mentioned, he narrates what the Prophet said when he entered into Medina. And when the Prophet gave this khatira, he was not speaking only to the Muslims. 
He said, Ayyuhan nas, O people, Afshu salam, spread salam, wa at'im al-ta'am, feed the people, wa salam al-ham, join family relations, wa sallu bil-layli wa nasu niyam, pray to hajju, pray at night, while people are sleeping, tadkhul jannata bi salam. You will enter Jannah with peace. I wanted to investigate and go through this quickly, this hadith in particular. And if we really break it down, there's four things. And when you look at this, this is really an equation that the Prophet ﷺ has given us. The very first one being spreading salam, afshu salam. Why is spreading salam so important? We all know that you know when you meet people, it's become almost a cultural thing. Salaam how are you? We don't even say it correctly, and that's fine. At least if the intention is there, inshallah khair. But more than that, we need to understand what it means when we say salam to someone. What are we saying when I say to you, as-salamu alaykum? It is not just a greeting that I'm saying instead of hello. It's not just ASK. Rather, this is, may Allah's peace, may His blessings, may His mercy be upon you. Now take it for a moment and step back. Whenever we make dua for people that we love, even if they have some element within them that we dislike, we're making dua for them because we love this person, because we care for this person. <coughs> Generally, more often than not, when somebody is mad at us or we feel upset at someone else, we're not going to be making dua for them. So when you think about what you're doing, when you're saying salam to someone, you're making dua for them. May you be protected. May salam be upon you, be upon your family, all those who are in your life. It doesn't make sense that we can give it to someone that we have hatred or ill feelings in towards in our heart. And that's something that we have to consider, right? If we're giving salam to someone, if someone is mahal, someone deserves to be given salam, and that means that they are a Muslim, then that means that we shouldn't have any ill feelings in our hearts towards them. If we do have ill feelings in our hearts towards them, we need to talk to them. We need to sort out this problem. Because there's another narration where the Prophet ﷺ mentions that when the deeds go in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Monday and Thursday, one of the people whose sins, whose sins are not forgiven is the one who is quarreling, who has some issue with their brother, with their sister, who won't say salam to their brother or their sister. This tells us what a great stance salam is. And then, more than that, think about what it means when you just give someone a smile. The Prophet ﷺ's sunnah, of course, was to smile when he gave salam. Shake someone's hand, face them fully. When he turned to speak to someone, he turned to them fully. It wasn't just, hey, salam, man, how you doing? No, it was, assalamu alaikum, how are you? Imagine how you must feel. Imagine how any of us feel when someone takes their attention away from whatever thing it is that they're doing and turns it entirely towards us. Don't we feel happy? Don't we feel nicer inside? Because we know that this person at this moment in time is giving us their full attention. This is a way to build bonds of brotherhood, to build bonds of sisterhood. Don't just walk into a gathering and say, Salaamu Alaikum, I fulfilled my fault. Go to each person, Assalamu Alaikum, how are you, Akhir? Assalamu Alaikum, how are you, my sister? For one, we'll get rewarded for the smile. For two, we'll get rewarded for each and every single salam that we give. And which of us is such that we're not in need of good deeds? Who here can raise their hand and say, I don't need any good deeds that come from giving salam to people? These are the easy ones. You know, you play video games, they always have the easy levels, you just cut through it real quick, 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 and then they have the harder levels. This is the easy level. You just walk up to someone, Salaamu Alaikum brother, how are you? And it builds a sense of community. <coughs> because if I walk into the masjid and I know that when I walk in, someone is going to turn to me, if I just make eye contact with them, at that moment in time, they're going to turn to me and say, Salaamu Alaikum. Don't you think people will want to be at a place where they receive smiles from people? Don't you think people will want to be at a place where someone is constantly giving them salam when they walk in? This is how we make the masjid more accessible for everyone. Whether they be a child, whether they be an adult. 
whether they be a sister, whether they be a brother. This is how we make the masjid accessible to everyone. Just say salam. I can tell you personally, when I first walked into a masjid, the very first time I walked into a particular masjid, my masjid back home in Baltimore, I will never forget it. Because when I walked in, it was as if I couldn't get through the lobby. Because as I walked, every time someone made eye contact with me, said, I'm like, how are you doing, brother? Said, I'm like, how are you doing, brother? Said, I'm like, how are you doing, brother? And right from that moment, I knew this was a place I wanted to be. I knew that this was a place I was going to come back to. Don't get caught up in the intricacies of culture either. Culture tells us, and it's right, that a younger person should give salam first. That is right, and that is fair. However, are we going to miss out on the opportunity for a reward just because we think that someone else is I'm more deserving to receive salam than give salam? It's not how it works. And in fact, it'll be as if on the day of judgment we stand there and say, Why didn't, when we're all wishing we had more good deeds, those are the ones we're going to miss. I should have said salam. Yeah, it was a 10-year-old. Yeah, it was a 12-year-old. And I was a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old. But if I had just said salam, 10 more good deeds on the list. If I had just said salam, another 10 more good deeds on the list. It's easy, easy ways to wrap them up. And it's an easy way to build a sense of community. This is why the Prophet said, Afsh salam. It's not just me saying this. The Prophet told us. And this is the first in this equation. The second part of this equation Feed the people. Now, understand something, brothers. Understand something, sisters. Feeding people is not an exclusive activity. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to feed the hungry, He does not say, No. The Prophet here didn't say, And in the very beginning of this hadith, He said, Ayyuhannas. Not ayyuhal muslimun. O people, feed each other. Feed the people. This is something that in our own society we lack. My teacher, he mentioned that his own teacher, he used to curse the freezer. He said that this has taken away the haq of the ghuraba, taken away the haq of the poor. Because before, when people were hungry, they would go to someone's house, whatever they had had that night, they would just give them. Because why? They couldn't freeze it. They couldn't throw it in the freezer. If you made too much biryani, you made too much nahari, it didn't go in the freezer. It went to the poor people. It went to the folks who were in need of it. But this concept has gone away from us because now all we're thinking about is how can this benefit me more? How can I use this to extract even more benefit from myself? Think about this shift in ideology. But if we work on feeding the people, and what we have to understand is, brothers and sisters, is that there is none of us sitting in this gathering. Alhamdulillah, we live in the richest country in the history of the world. In all of world history, there has not been a country known to have had as much wealth as this country does. There are amenities and luxuries that we have that no one else can lay claim to. Kings from the past couldn't lay claim to the luxuries that we have. We talked about it in the Harqa this Wednesday. Where Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As radiallahu one day he was distributing some wealth to the poor. And a man came and he said, Ya Amir, he said, Oh Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, alasna min al-fuqara al-muhajirin, are we not from the poor of those who came to the city of Egypt? And he asked him a question. And he said, Alaka imra'atun ta'wi ilayha? Are you married? Are you married? And he said, Naam. He said, فَأَنْتَ مِنَ الْأَغْنِيَ The first thing that he said, are you married? And he said, do you have a house? فَلَكَ مَسْكَنٌ تَسْكُنُهَا Do you have a home that you live in? He said, now. He said, فَأَنْتَ مِنَ الْأَغْنِيَ Two things, just two things this command companion of the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. If you are married, and if you have a home to live in, أَنْتَ مِنَ الْأَغْنِيَ and this man, then not only does he stop there, he actually continues. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As doesn't ask him, but he says, I have a khadim as well. I have someone who serves me as well. His response, subhanAllah, You are from the kings. And all of us sit here today and say, well, I don't have a servant. 
But you do have servants, don't you? You have a dishwasher that you put your dishes into, you push a button, and guess what? Your dishes are clean like that. You have a washing machine that you put your clothes into, and an hour later, they are not only washed, but they're dry, they're free of wrinkles. No press necessary. You have a stove that you turn on, you have an oven that you just push a button for, and your food is done, it'll automatically sense the temperature, figure everything out, that's your khadim. That's your servant. فَأَنْتُمْ مِنَ الْمُلُوكِ all of us are from those who are kings. Brothers, please, if we can tighten up more, inshallah. Eventually, we do have people standing in the back. I know it's going to get tight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about those who focus only on themselves, He never speaks of them highly. Think about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in Surah Al-Fajr. فَأَمَّا الْإِنسَانَ إِذَا مَرْتَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ فَأَكْرَمُهُ وَنَعْمُهُ فَيَقُولُ رَبِّي أَكْرَمًا When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this one person comes and we test him with his wealth and we give him great expanse, we give him a lot of wealth and he says, my Lord has honored me. And then he says, وَأَمَّا إِذَا مَرْتَ لَهُ فَقَدْرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقًا Then when we test him by tightening that risk, the bank account suddenly goes from this to this. At that moment in time, what does he say? يَقُولُ رَبِّي أَهَانَ My Lord is disgracing. It's just up and down, up and down. If it's good, good times, then guess what? Allah has honored me. If it's bad times, Allah has disgraced me. Kalla, Allah says. Bella tukrimuna yatim. No, you don't dare talk about me doing this for you or not doing this for you. Think about what you don't do. You don't honor orphans. And you don't compete, you don't try to feed poor people. You just focus on yourselves about more and more and more. And think about the mindset of somebody, brothers and sisters. Think about the mindset of somebody who when they say, when times are good, Allah has honored me. When times are bad, Allah has disgraced me. What is their mindset? It's about what's happening to them. That's all they're focused on. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. This is not the right way. وَتُحِبُّونَ الْمَالَ حُبًّا جَمَّا and you love wealth, a great love. This is what goes against this hadith, brothers and sisters. What we focus on is not that aspect of what we can benefit ourselves with, but what we can benefit others with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the greatness of those who give to others. That they're afraid, they fulfill their oaths, and they're afraid of the day that's coming, the day of judgment. And they feed those despite their own love for that food. You know what? I love my mother's biryani. I love my father's food. All these things, I love them and I want to have it for as long as I possibly can. But instead of putting it in the freezer, you know what I do? I take it outside and I donate it to someone who I know is in need of. I go to my neighbor's home who I know is struggling and I say, hey, I made you some food. I don't focus on myself and feeding other people and the response when they're asked, when people come to them and say, MashaAllah, you're so generous. <inaudible> we only fed you for the sake of Allah. We did this so Allah would love us. <inaudible> I don't want any reward from you. I don't want any thanks from you either. I don't need it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give me my reward. This is the beauty of feeding people. There's a story of a great Ansari, Abu Talha radiallahu anhu. One day the Prophet said, a man came to him and he said that, Ya Rasulullah, I've fallen on hard times. And the Prophet said, he looked around for something, if he had any food, he didn't. And so he said, Rahimahullah, is there anyone? Is there anyone in this gathering who will just host this man for the night? Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, he's one of those Sahabis who was just habituated to giving. So he stands up immediately and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I'll do it. I'll host him. So he goes home and he tells his wife, this is a famous story. He tells his wife that get ready, we have a guest coming. She says, what are you talking about? We don't have any food. We only have enough food. We barely have enough food to feed our kids. He says, listen, just tell the kids to go to bed. And what we'll do, and there's different versions of this narration. But the one that's so beautiful is that he says, what we'll do is we're going to dim the lights and what we'll do is we'll put food on the guest's plate 
and we won't have any food on our plate. But he'll eat in the dark and we'll make noises as if we're eating. We'll make noises as if we're eating. And then he won't feel bad that we're giving our food to him. The next day, he goes back to the Prophet ﷺ just to see him. لَقَدْ ضَحِكَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ مِنْ فُلَانٍ وَفُلَانٍ SubhanAllah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laughs at the slave and his wife. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is overjoyed with the slave and his wife. And he reveals the verse, the verse in the Quran, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They give preference to others even though they have a need with their own selves. <coughs> Imagine that, subhanAllah. You are the sabbu nuzul you are the reason for this verse being revealed. Because you preferred someone else over him, himself. He preferred someone else over his own self. This is what feeding others can do, brothers and sisters. It allows us to give preference to others when perhaps our minds have been habituated to preferring only ourselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all tawfiq. <laughs> الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة المتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المسلمين سيدنا ونبينا ومعه وحمد وآله وصحبه وسلم قال الله تعالى في كتاب الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا نبلو أنكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال ونقص والثمرات وبشر الصابئين الذين إذا أصابت مصيبة قالوا إن لله وإن إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلاة من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك مهتدون فقال النبي الكريم صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه وقم قال عليه الصلاة والسلام أما بعد The third thing the Prophet صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم mentions in this hadith وصول الرحام Join family relations And in the scope of things when we understand this this actually has one of the most profound impacts on an individual Family relations are such that when they're broken, you can see that within a person. There is a hole or a, a loneliness that always exists, and it's, it's difficult. You know, our convert brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase them. We can't imagine what they go through when their families reject them and push them away. And unfortunately, the reality is, more often than not, we then as a community reject them as well. They have nowhere to go for Eid because we want to have exclusive parties with our own selves. They have nothing to do on these joyous occasions except come to the masjid and then watch as everybody leaves to their own gatherings and parties. But you can see that pain within them. And we can see that pain within people who have difficulty or have strained family relations. Family relations are what help an individual stand on their own, have strength in their dealings. And it isn't solely restricted to our household, our aunts and our uncles, all those who are outside of it. And then, the truth is, is that we, if we look even deeper, we have to remember that our own family within our homes, whether it's our parents, if we're younger, or if it's our wife and our children, if we're older, our husbands and our children, if we're older. If we don't have good relationships with them, that's going to affect the community. Because if a man, na'udhu billah, is beating his wife and she's coming to the community, do you think that she can do as much khayr as she could otherwise? <coughs> do you think that she's going to be able to give as much to the community as otherwise? No. These are all things, the one, as the Prophet wasallam, the best among us, khayrukum, khayrukum li ahli. The best of you is the best to his family, to his wife. The best to their spouse. <laughs> this is what we understand from the hadith of the Messenger Family relations are one of the most key aspects for us in our deen. And finally, number four, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامُ Pray at night. This refers to our personal ibadat. If you're fasting, that's great, alhamdulillah. But don't go around telling everybody you're fasting. There's a, there's a funny story that's always mentioned that a brother... People are watching him pray, and he's praying for a long time, and people are just mentioning, wow, subhanAllah, mashallah, he's been praying for such a long time, what a great guy. And all of a sudden, this man who's praying turns around and says, he has some fasting too, by the way. <laughs> but that's what we call the minor shirk 
as the Prophet warned us of, al riya riya And this is what the Prophet said, I fear this for you more than the Masih al-Dajjal. I fear this for you more than the fitna of Dajjal. Riya, doing things for the sake of showing off. This is why personal ibadat has to be, of course, in the masjid, inshallah, but more than that, it also has to be something we're just doing while nobody else knows. Have some form of ibadah that no one but is that is no between no one except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's one line of Quran per day, just keep that and don't let anyone else know. If it's two rak'ah before you go to sleep, keep that and let no one else know. Let it be your and Allah's secret. This is the ibadah that builds a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when we look at this entire hadith, we realize that the final step, salam, this is the answer to the equation. All those added together equal We enter Jannah with peace. The angels would say to us, Enter this place peacefully. Safe, no more Islamophobia. No one, no one more asking you why you wear a towel on your head. No one saying why do you have to pray at this time and that time. No. Just enter this place safely, peacefully. That's the goal at the end of the day. And for anyone who feels that perhaps they're not at a location, they're not at a place in their knowledge or their understanding of the deen to be able to do these things, understand that you can use it as a step-by-step -step process. Start by spreading salam. When we walk out of here today, there should not be a person whom we make eye contact with that we don't say salam to. Make salam to people. Every time you see a Muslim, say salam. Number two, when we have an opportunity, feed the people. If we feed others and focus on feeding others rather than our own selves, that's the next step. Then, if we go into the next facet and we have good relations with our families, our parents and our spouses, we do nice things for the sake of doing nice things, we'll find that we'll continue to grow. And that last part is quite possibly the hardest, that personal ibadah. Because people always feel, I don't know enough Qur'an to be able to read tahajjud. I don't know enough of this, I don't know enough of that to read Qur'an properly. Just know, if we follow this equation, the ending is that we're in Jannah. And how could it be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to let us float away into Jannah? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open our hearts if we spread salah. And He'll bring us closer to Islam. He will open our hearts if we feed other people and bring us closer to Him and allow us the knowledge and the opportunity to reach that final step. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant all of us Jannah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts and allow us to come closer to Him. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us like the Sahaba. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا أنفسنا وإن لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا وكنا من الخاسرين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء وينقي البغي يعينكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله الذي يذكركم ويشكركم ويستغفر ويغفر لكم وتقول يجعل لكم من أمركم مخجاركم الصالح